title is Assistant Director of ISS in charge of systems and network services. Fundamentally, I act as our architect. Um, anyway, I was a, a chief technical officer, that sort of thing. I wear a number of hats uh, in that way. Uh, we're a small, mid-sized university, master's level, about 7,000 students, so they're about to give you an idea. Washburn University is located in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, you may remember us as having renamed ourselves Google Kansas and trying to, attempting to get the Google Fiber project. And on April 1st, April Fool's Day, Google renamed themselves Topeka, which was quite a shock to us. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to start off with a little bit of uh, what we dealt with. Uh, the, the fundamental problem we had, um, we had I can, and I had coming in, I, I came into this position about four years ago, and I've been working to do a lot of uh, consolidation and uh, designing for scalability. Storage is where we're at right now, and this is, this is what we're dealing with. We've got um, what you might call siloed or stranded storage. Storage that was purchased for specific products, for specific solutions, um, that really isn't useful down the road. Um, either it's the performance, you've got performance, but it's not where you need it. You've got storage space, but not where you need it, and you can't bring it all together. And as, uh, as one of my techs like to tell me, he's trying to manage uh, 11 different storage devices, seven different user interfaces, and it's very hard to keep straight over time. Um, I'm going to cover some of the, the major ones we're dealing with here as well, and the ones I'm working with in particular with Nexenta. Uh, we have an IBM uh, DS3400 storage controller, which uses fiber channel. Um, it's, it's a fiber channel head backing some uh, IBM SAS storage. That's going to our uh, IBM uh, P550, which is our AIX server. Uh, that runs, primarily runs our Oracle databases and applications. Um, those are direct connected. We don't have a SAN fi uh, fiber infrastructure. So that was uh, purchased all as a solution. Uh, we have an IBM DS3300 storage controller, which presents its interface with the same kind of storage presented as the iSCSI. Uh, that is connected to our VMware cluster, uh, which is a number of you know, IBM uh, 3850 M2 servers, uh, I think roughly 96 cores and countless uh, gigabytes of RAM in there. Very good system, but the underlying storage is a, uh, a limiting point right now. Uh, we have a Sun Storage Tech 6140 storage array. This is fiber channel, fiber channel disk, 15,000 RPM. Uh, very, very nice storage, very underutilized. I can't do anything else with it other than the system is, use it with the system is tied to a Sun Netra T5220, which is uh, we're back into your mail system. Uh, we have uh, had some Windows NAS storage servers. Uh, these things, the last of them went into production literally the week before I started at Washburn, and I knew from the beginning when I got there, I saw this, I knew those were gonna be the bane of my existence. They're SATA 7200 RPM drives, trying to, to provide profiles and homes for all of our users. It is ugly, <laughs> as you can well imagine. And we've got multiple of these. Um, that, again, that provides our, our CIFS clients uh, primarily. Uh, like I said, that has just been a, a nonstop nightmare. Uh, we also had an um, older EMC Solera. This, everything in this thing went totally end of life. Um, I think it was this summer. Um, and so basically, it's, it needs to go away. It only represents maybe two or three terabytes of storage, as old as it is. But it had some very critical data on it. And again, we didn't have anywhere to put it that had the same performance characteristics and accessibility. Uh, that also provided NFS, which I don't have listed here. So new digital storage, he's got demands from academic units, that sort of thing. So that's what we've got coming in. We have a public television station uh, on campus, KTWU, which has been, as you can imagine, facing a number of budget cuts over the past few years. They're looking for ways. We all, they already have, their, have much of their uh, um, data equipment uh, housed in our server room, uh, looking to cons um, consolidate and utilize our infrastructure. We had to have an infrastructure to be able, for them to be able to work with, though, and this is part of what we're doing here. Uh, as you know, that's kind of like we're building an internal cloud in that sense. Um, and then, you know, just other things. You know, the students don't sit there, put a VHS in the thing, put the headphones on and listen to their, listen to the things anymore. They, they expect to be able to be in their room, be wherever, have access to the videos that are relevant to their classes, and that's what we need to be able to provide. Uh, similarly, we have been, as you can imagine, struggling along with tape backup for entirely too long. And this is part of what we also needed to do. Again, we needed to have an infrastructure that we could utilize so that we could actually start pulling things onto, onto disk-based backup, uh, be able to do off-site uh, uh, replication of that as well. Um, you know, obviously we need a solution that was, that was scalable. Uh, we've got future needs coming down there, and I've got a whole bunch of siloed systems that simply are not. 
and that just was untenable for continuing down the road. Uh, but we also need to be able to accommodate the existing systems we have. You know, we have these AIX servers running our banner database, and you know, the, the company that helps support us with that is way behind. Um, just about the time that uh, IBM announces end of life for AIX 5.3, uh, they announced the beginning of support for AIX 6.1, the next version. So uh, <laughs> we're having to deal with uh, technology that's, that's quickly going obsolete at the same time as uh, dealing with newer stuff. Uh, we also, you know, frankly, we just don't have a lot of money to go around. And uh, I need to be able to justify the upfront cost of a consolidated system. You know, one of the questions I'm sure you've faced is, well, I can go down to Best Buy and I can buy two terabytes for under 100 bucks. Why does this cost so much? So I need to get the best value for my money. Well, one of the big problems I had um, is that, uh, you know, we, I went out and talked to a number of vendors, basically spent a year researching this. Um, for most of them, talked to them, Tell my budget, well, we can get you the heads and maybe a little bit of storage. And that just wasn't, you know, doing something like that just wasn't going to fly as far as getting the budget in as well as, and it certainly wasn't going to meet our needs. Sure, it might have been something we could grow. Oh, and most of them also like to say things like, oh, uh, well, we can't do this function, we can't do that function. You're basically going to have to throw all that old storage away because we're not going to be able, we're not going to work with you on that. So, yeah. And, you know, I, I, at least I, you know, did have recognition of the problem. And the problem becomes, well, what are you going to do about it? Because that all falls on my head. Uh, you know, I reached out to peers, reached out to our technology partner, partners, did my own research. And I think I may have uh, skipped something here. In any case, um, as I was doing, doing the research and working with our technology partners, I really started looking at, you know, okay, what's the solution we are providing? What's the underlying technology that's supporting this? Um, the thing that really, I mean, literally kept me up at night was worrying about putting all the storage in and having it backed by hardware RAID, RAID 5, RAID 6. I mean, that scared the hell out of me, and I, I can show you why right here. Uh, you know, at, at the modern data skills we're dealing with today, uh, data loss modes are usually more theoretical, uh, just a few years ago, are really becoming practical. Uh, if you look at um, the bit, uh, unrecoverable bit error rate of various devices, commodity SATA, uh, it's 10 to the, 10 to the 14th uh, bits, that's 12.5 terabytes. Uh, enterprise SATA is by an order of magnitude better, uh, as is commodity SaaS, enterprise SaaS, again, an uh, order of terabyte better, um, and, and so on. Um, and as you can see, certainly anything with spinning disk, you do enough reads and write there, you're going to have a failure. In fact, just this morning, I got an email from one of our systems because it had an unrecoverable read error on one of its drives. And God knows what that is. Somebody's data is cor corrupted out there, and that's, again, that, that just scares the hell out of me. Um, you know, more theoretical issues out there, the, the whole bit rot, uh, cosmic radiation coming in there and flipping a bit. Uh, when you're dealing with, with these large data scales, the chance of that happening uh, it gets to the point of being a real concern. Uh, other uh, random unpredictable uh, bit level events. So just a quick exercise for those of you out there. Take an eight terabyte uh, rate, or eight disk, uh, rate five or rate two terabyte SATA disks, um, seven data, one parity, you know, you know, you know rate. Um, how many terabytes of usable storage do you have there? I mean, Think about it, you've got uh, seven data times two, 14 terabytes of usable storage. Drop disk, replace, drop one disk, replace and rebuild. What are the odds of encountering a bit error and losing data during that rebuild? The RAID 5 does not, it just does an XOR. It does not do any validation of the actual data out there. Um, fundamentally, in my mind, and you've heard this time and again, and I will reiterate it, RAID 5 is dead, and RAID 6, if it's not already dead, is dying. And I want to get the hell away from myself. Okay, so, you know, we were uh, researching solutions. Uh, we also looked at, you know, the, uh, the uh, higher level infrastructure, looking at traditional SANs, use fiber channel, uh, even fiber channel over Ethernet, uh, that's fairly new. Um, iSCSI, again, we did not have a, a uh, SAN infrastructure even to plug this stuff into. Uh, and as I'm working with these, most of them used, you know, RAID solutions on the back end, and they were just kept telling us, you know, you know you're going to be locked in with us, you can only, you know, we'll only work with, you know, with our storage, and uh, you'll have to buy all new storage if you want to work with this stuff and just throw the old away. So uh, ZFS, as I was, as I was doing uh, the research, really began to attract me. There are a couple solutions out there at the time, and there are more now that use, un if you look at them, they actually use ZFS on the back end. Um, and it's really, really incredible. I've got, I have a whole other presentation just on ZFS technology. We don't have time for it here today. But it is fantastic, and I've, I've used it a number of times to, to help people understand this. You know, it's a 128-bit file system. Your maximum pool size uh, for any single pool is 256 zettabytes. Hopefully, we won't be getting there anytime real soon. Um, it uses a copy-on-write transactional model plus end-to-end checksumming 
to provide the data integrity. It actually checks um, every block as it's read and written um, and, and stores that, stores multiple copies. So that even if you know, blocks of d uh, data get corrupted or bits of data get corrupted, it can go through an inquiry construct, it can understand what's going on. It's designed to accommodate uh, failure of the underlying media. It's designed to work on unreliable media. Um, very high, it's very high performance, got a number of features, IO pipelining, block, block level write optimization. Um, it's POSIX compliant, uh, it has extensible caches, um, just a lot of very, very nice features that, that made it look extremely good. Um, the ZFS also has presentation layers, which as you know, can support SIFs, NFS, iSCSI, FC, and others that are coming down the road, as well as you know, local file system, what have you. Um, after a lot of my time researching this, I, I really do believe that the future of enterprise storage lies with ZFS. Now, it may be called, if you look 10 years down the road, it may be something a little bit different, but if you look at the feature set that ZFS has now, it's an open source, and they can, anybody can come and raid the, uh, uh, you know, raid the code, that's gonna be the baseline uh, feature set you're gonna see on anything, whether it's open source or commercial or what have you, and this is, that's what everything's gonna be building from from here on out. I just, I, I don't see the old, the old ways of doing things with, with the, the, the file systems, we're all familiar with NTFS, AXT, uh, rated systems and whatnot, that's based upon assumptions that were made back in the early 90s at best, and uh, we've extended um, to the limit of its lifespan. So, uh, then getting into this, you know, Nixenta, and the question is, who, everyone asks us, I dealt with it, who is that, and you know, why would we even look at them? Um, and what it was, as I was, as I was looking at the solutions out there, uh, Nixenta was really the most open to supporting our innovative uses. Basically, they were the only ones, even of, of the ones who had ZFS on the back end, who would say, yeah, we'll work with you on that. Most of them say, that this is, you know, this is what we, we just present iSCSI, or we just do this, that sort of thing. And Nixenta was really the only one that was really willing to work with us, um, and they support presenting it in the multiple different ways that the underlying technology does. I mean, the underlying technology is solid, it's good, it can do these things. But you know, you, there, there's the whole matter of support and implementation and some testing and whatnot, getting everything to work right in the, in the real world. And they're willing to work with us on that. We, we don't have vendor lock-in. Uh, we've had that bite us uh, too many times. I want to have the ability to, well, we, we have a really good relationship now. We uh, purchased our system from Area Data Systems. Um, we have a really good relationship with them. I don't want to be so tied to them that um, I, I don't have any other options. You know, God knows what could happen to us down the road. And I want this thing, you know, this, this is going to have to last us for a while. This is an infrastructure that needs to be scalable that I may need to, you know, work with another, you know, who, you know, look at the storage situation five years ago versus now. What's it going to be like five years from now? I need to have an infrastructure that I, I can work with on that. Um, also, we're very attracted to their open source commitment uh, through nexenta.org. Um, it really helps us to ensure support and availability of, of the solution in the long term. And finally, frankly, uh, it really had the lowest cost in terms of dollars per gigabyte for any of these enterprise solutions. So, uh, talk a bit about our implementation. Um, phase one, obviously, was just an it, acquire the initial HA cluster node and, and a SAS storage expansions. We've got a little diagram. It can be a little, might be a little hard to, I'm not sure how well you can read that there, but we've got two uh, cluster nodes at the top and the SAS storage at the bottom. Uh, they're connected with um, uh, the InfiniBand, the, the SAS backend. Um, the, the nodes, I may have overbuilt them, but that's fine. Uh, I've, you know, one of the things I really like about uh, Open Solaris, Solaris Lumos is it's got very, very good thread handling in the kernel, and I wanted to be able to take advantage of that. So I got two six-core processors in each of those nodes. Um, RAM is really the most important thing for implementation. I got 192 gig and basically maxed out the RAM on those nodes. Uh, SSD art cache extension. I get eight, eight gig uh, Zeus, tech Zeus RAM for Zill, and uh, 10 gig and fiber channel, 10 gig Ethernet and fiber channel HVAs all in those head nodes. Uh, and so this is, like I said, this, I, you know, tried to get, build a very solid head to work with, something I could, uh, you know, and, and that would last us, you know, for a few years. It's also, you know, again, I, I, this is a start. This is a starting point for future expansion. And again, that's, that's, that's what I need. We've got about 70 terabytes of uh, usable storage on this right now, once you've got it all partitioned into pools and whatnot. Um, I, I can't, I do, I would, because we are going to be pressed for time, I'd like to keep questions to a minimum, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, so um, I, I will be glad to take these questions either, you know, after his presentation or after that outside. 
Um, uh, they were, and honestly, I don't remember the model. They're, they're hmm? Yeah, yeah, I, I don't remember at this point. It's, it's been six months since I looked at that, and it was just, you know, it was, it's the Xeon, um, the, the fastest, you know, memory bus and whatnot that I could, because I, I wanted the 1333 bus and all that sort of thing. I was more, more worried about those sorts of things. Um, we also built, to support this, uh, 10 gig iSCSI fabric. Uh, we utilized Brocade VDX, uh, 67, a pair of VDX 6720 cluster switches. Uh, these are pretty neat. This was, this was also an interesting experience because we're the first ones in the region to actually buy these units. They, they were interested in getting them out and they offered us a good deal and, and they know from, we've worked with Brocade for a long time since back in the Foundry days too. And they know we're good to work with. We, we like kind of experimenting with some things because sometimes we can do like we did here. They basically gave, it, they gave us these for the price of, uh, of, the, of another one I was looking at because they were interested in getting these out in this field. And I was willing to work with it to get the latest technology in my server room because God knows when I'm going to be able to expand, you know, expand it again to get the money to do that. So it was a learning experience. It works very, very well now. And I'm, I'll cover that in a little bit. Um, uh, we also uh, migrate. The, one of the first things we want to do is get rid of those Windows storage servers. Uh, and so the migration of so that SIS storage uh, from the NAS to the next CENTA um, is a big deal. With that's actually still in progress. Um, we have the bulk data replicated. We do a, a, a regular replication of that. Um, and that's out there providing shared, you know, shared network storage. If our current systems go down, well not, there's just the whole process of migrating the accounts. Right now, our, our delay there uh, primarily is um, hesitation on the part of our, our governance and advisory bodies. They want us to wait till the end of semester, even though they're suffering the performance on the, on the old system. They say that, fine, we'll wait and it will begin the migration, uh, the actual migration. We're still doing regular replication, so it won't take near as long. Um, uh, similarly, migration of NFS storage from the EMC uh, to the next center, um, that's in progress. It's been presenting fine. Uh, VMware integration, we actually completed this well ahead of our, our expected schedule. It was uh, remarkably easy, actually. Uh, we have an, e we had a, uh, have an ESXi 4.1 cluster. We've done a good job of keeping that thing up to date. Um, so now we have to deal with five here pretty quick. Um, and again, I, I mentioned just how many cores, 84 cores, that's 600 gig of RAM. We're running about 200 active servers on that. Um, as you can imagine, this back, the, the storage that backs this up right now is this IBM DS3300. It's a pretty good head node, but it, it's all, um, it's you know, not high speed storage. And so it gets, it gets pretty worked up. So we don't put um, uh, disk IO intensive applications on there right now. However, we have done proof of concept integration. It's, it's, it's integrated with the VMware. We can take and we can vMotion over to that as, uh, uh, as back and forth with um, test and production boxes, no interruption service. Uh, it's absolutely fantastic and you know, just assumes like everyone's comfortable with saying, okay, let's roll it over. Uh, we'll be able to move everything onto that. We're moving the test servers already. It's, it's just great. Um, uh, we connect. We have fiber channel. Um, our IBM P550 server had four gig fiber channel. Uh, the, the the server itself has uh, eight Power Five processors. We use DL PARS, which is um, similar to virtualization that you you actually hard partition um, the 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 system into multiple slices, and we've got that out into about 14 AX5361 systems. Um, and again, that. And that's connected into the system. We can demonstrate that we can actually, you know, mount the, the file systems and whatnot. That's just going to take downtime, which is going to be really hard to get on our Oracle systems to actually move that over. Um, uh, server uh, block level storage migration. Um, again, I mentioned the VMware. We're basically ready at any time. No downtime required. Uh, on the P550, downtime will be required, but the proof of concept is done. So we know we can do these things. Um, iSCSI proof of concept has been completed. Basically, one of the things we're talking about is taking some of these old storage devices, especially like these, these NAS devices. It would be useful for us in many cases just to have large chunks of temporary storage for non-critical items. And that's essentially what they're gonna do. These things, they've got no warranty, but they're just, they're a hell of a lot of disk. Uh, we're gonna turn them into rock simple iSCSI filers, put a plug in the next center, let next center manage them. We've already done this. Uh, we, this is actually one of the very first things we did working with the Nextenda Community Edition on an old Dell 1850 server when we were doing our proof of concepts back then. Worked beautifully. And um, you know, the Nextenda uh, really masked the uh, terrible performance of the, <laughs> of the inherent uh, iSCSI systems there. And so this will be you know, very, very handy, useful for us to have 
um, just for like say non-critical storage. Um, and again, again, once we got once these migrations are complete, um, you know, once we can free up those disks, then we can start reconfiguring them. these fiber channel disks, the DS 3300, 3400, uh, reconfigure them, and then have multiple tiers of storage. We've got, you know, like I say, some very, very nice high performance drives, and we've got some low performance bulk storage. If we can take this, put it behind the uh, Nexenta, we'll be doing great. We'll also be making my admins happy. They'll have one management interface for all of this. That's one of the big keys uh, for them. This, this is kind of like what our own, well, it's showing up here, it's a little overrunning the edges there, but how the whole thing uh, looks once it's all been put together. You've got our Nexenta cluster servers. They've got fiber channel coming in, um, because I don't want to have to buy some fiber channel switches right now, just, and I've only got a limited amount of that for these two servers going into it. Um, and then going back out to the P550, then we're done with fiber channel. We're not going to invest any more in fiber channel. Uh, SAS storage, we can expand that as needed. Um, we've got our DS3300, which is iSCSI, one gig, as well as our, our, um, our other units, which we're just, like say, going to turn to rock simple filers. Uh, plug those into the I iSCSI um, uh, fabric up there. And again, I've got dual 10 gig cards in each of those uh, uh, cluster servers. Uh, 10 gig uh, fiber, ch uh, fiber channel fabric. Uh, one of the reasons we, we did this too is because we don't, our, our backbone network is still primarily one gig. There isn't anything out there right now that demands that. And so I needed to be able to have a, essentially a separate network to be able to fully support that, that 10 gig. And so it's, it's basically running on its own, not, it's, it's a dedicated storage network. Uh, and that connects to our, our VMware infrastructure on 10 gig, uh, 10 gig iSCSI. And again, that's, that's, that iSCSI is, uh, infrastructure is working beautifully. Um, an additional uh, element we're doing, which is part of our, our RFP, was a, a second node for offsite backup. Um, this is basically bulk storage for archival and recovery purposes. Um, so that we can you know, either you know, put it up, uh, either you know, put that thing into production if we have to, um, or at least you know, like say, have, have the backup offsite in case something happens at our main site and we're not having to try and recover everything from tape because we have to go back and we have to buy the server, buy the tape drive, get the data off the tapes, you know, build the systems, what have you. God help us, that'd be that'd take forever. <laughs> so we, so we have, it's primarily a cold backup site, but we have the capability there to actually recover in a lot better um, response time than we have right now. Uh, this is base, it's a single head node system. It's, I, I used basically a scaled down version of the same system so that if I needed to in extremis, I could either hook our, st our other stuff up to it or have it you know, potentially replace one of the other head nodes. Again, I'm trying to maintain standardization across these systems as well. Um, and it's got a big tray of three, uh, three gigs, 24 3 gig SAS drives. And that's, uh, and that's actually should be arriving while I'm here this week. And we'll start putting that up very soon. Huh? Three terabyte drives. Yep. Again, this is bulk storage. This isn't live. This is for backup. Um, we're utilizing the Nexenta auto sync function out, planning on using that to uh, do that, do the initial replication plus snapshots thereafter. Um, you know, after that, we only need to, to transfer the delta from the previous snapshot. Uh, one thing to help understand, we've got uh, a number of potential backup sites. We've got uh, one gig fiber from our camp main campus to our uh, tech college campus. Uh, we also have a one gig uh, internet connection through the Kansas Research and Education Network to a 10 gig fiber backbone that goes to all the other state institutions. We could drop a, a unit in one of their server rooms, replicate over them, and it really wouldn't touch that, the, the bandwidth that, that's there. And if we need more, we can go up to 10 gig on that backbone without too much trouble. Again, uh, that, that was one of the things, that was last year, we got that thing in, and we have a, we have a scalable system now. That is just, that's, that's just so important for us, we need that capability. Um, and again, this can be rate limited if you're worried about the throughput, uh, and it's un independent of the underlying transport uh, mechanism. So like I say, very, very attractive for uh, replicating or bulk data offsite. Um, the end game for us then is my admins get a single interface to manage uh, storage and disk space backup. Uh, ZFS helps to ensure the reliability and performance of the disparate storage systems. And uh, Nexenda and Area Data Systems provide support for an integrated system. Um, we recognize going into this, you know, we're plugging in third party hardware to this, that's gonna be our problem. We've got some very talented people. We've had a lot of fun with the, uh, the community edition, and you know we're we're not so much concerned about that. Um, you know, they're uh, uh, Nexenta and area are willing to help, but obviously, you know, they're they're not going to support the IBM hardware. So you know, we, we have to take some of our own calculated risks in there, but I, I think we're being reasonable. 
uh, experience, I set aside about three months to test this. Six months was recommended, so this is an aggressive schedule. Uh, this stuff got in um, at the beginning, at the very beginning of September, basically September 1st. Um, and so we're right at the tail end of the, the test period I'd set aside. And we, like I said, we've really done better than I'd expected. I expected us to overrun the schedule. Um, the initial replication of the SIFS data, uh, our experience of this, has been difficult. We've got errors in the source file system. There's you know, corruption in NTFS once you start uh, getting down in there trying to copy this stuff. God knows what's happened down there because you can't do a check disk on this stuff when it's uh, live all the time. Um, there's some areas where there have been permission, weird permissions problems and we have to go through and seize ownership, change permissions, that have it back and that sort of thing. Um, the sheer volume of data, particularly the small files and profiles uh, and the like, really slows down the copy. Uh, that's again why it was important to get that bulk copy done first. Um, the incremental updates we do, we've got a shared file system, it's far more data, it only takes about four hours. Our profiles and home users, it takes about three days for it to, to run through that. We're using a, a utility called RoboCopy, if you're familiar with Windows, that's, that's basically what the uh, standard tool for that sort of thing. So yeah, that, that's, that's a heck of a lot. When we migrate, we're gonna basically do it user by user, lock the account, migrate them, uh, which would just take a second, uh, unlock it. Um, NFS alone is fairly easy. We've set up uh, shared NFS and SIF storage where the same file system is, is presented out both ways. Uh, that did require substantial help from Nixenda to get right. They had some, some tips online. Uh, turns out we needed some additional information and whatnot. Some of that was a little bit dated or a little bit incomplete. So if you end up doing with that, uh, working on that yourselves, I would definitely contact Nixenda support. We do have it working now though. Um, iSCSI, the only real issues we had were with the Brocade BDX cluster. Again, it was brand new. Our sales engineers were like, oh, can we come see that? Um, uh, they work great once they're configured, um, but they did have some, at the time, undocumented requirements. Uh, we had all these wonderful little, you know, passive, uh, uh, the, I'm say InfiniBand, that's not quite right, the, the TwinX cables with SF, the SFPs ends on them um, for connecting that. A lot cheaper to do that than to use fiber. And, uh, and it just wouldn't bring the interfaces up. Uh, turns out, um, they, this is the first switch they've done this on. You have to use Brocade certified active uh, connectors for, for that to work. Yeah. So that was, that was a surprise. Um, they did help us get around that and we've got it up and running now. Up and running, it works great. Uh, fiber channel, again, we didn't have fiber channel infrastructure. I didn't have staff with experience with it. That was learning experience for us. If you have fiber channel experience, once we got it figured out, it was pretty easy. Um, just need, if, you don't, if you're new to it, need time for learning and understanding it. Basically, we got it set up, we're just gonna leave it alone, and eventually, uh, years from now, those things will age out, and we'll, we'll basically be at a uh, uh, 10 gig ethernet shop. Um, VMware ESX 4.1 integration was one of the easiest aspects. It needed some walkthrough with uh, Nexenta. We had the training beforehand and whatnot, but once set up, it was really easy. Uh, management is basically through vSphere. Um, one thing to note is that if you're using a VMware software switch, uh, LACP is not supported for uh, automatic uh, failover. We had to manually configure lag zones on the 37, uh, the, 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 the VDX switches, and, um, and, and on the VM, uh, the VM built in network. If you use the 1000V um, Cisco software switch, that capability is built in and it makes it very simple. Um, you, and we can beam with, hmm? Yep. Uh, we can vMotion from a live machine to old uh, from old storage to new, and vice versa, with zero downtime, zero service impact. We've done this time and again. Um, it's, it's very easy. My VM admins could not be happier. They are just ecstatic with this. Um, HA cluster. This was, quite honestly, the big pain point of the integration. This is where we spent a lot of our time testing, a lot of our time working with Nexenda to resolve. Um, there was, we, when this thing came in, it was the same week, they put 3.1 out. I said, let's go ahead and put 3.1 on there. Let's be at the latest. We'll work through the bugs. Uh, no, we're going to have some, and that sort of thing. Well, one of them was uh, uh, a bug that resulted in corrupted Z pools with failover. Those of you, if anyone has dealt with 3.1.0, you probably know about that. That they put out 3.1.1 real quick to correct that. So that 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 was that was some fun. But again, uh, we were in test mode. We were ready for that. We wanted to be the latest because once this thing goes into production, it's going to be static, very very much so for a long period. So try and get it as advanced as we can prior to going there. Uh, we had some issues with uh, drive controller hardware, uh, apparently at least partially related to bad hardware on, on the controller. We had situations where you could fail over from one node to the other, you couldn't fail back. Um, it would fail and then neither side would say that the, the storage was there. Um, looks like we may have that resolved. 
Um, we had some scary moments because of behavior that we weren't, we didn't know about, weren't expecting. Um, related to that, HA will panic the kernel if it can't tell who owns the volume to protect data. If you attended the HA session yesterday, you found out about that. When that first happened, we about went nuts because we didn't know why our brand new systems were kernel panicking. Well, it was because they were told to kernel panic uh, because it, had to, it was doing that to protect the data. Um, we had to re manually re-enable failover after initial failover, again, something they covered in the HA. We didn't know that initially, so we're doing, okay, let's, let's pull something, force a failover. Okay, now let's pull something, see if it fails back. Oh, no, it doesn't because we hadn't manually re-enabled failover. Just something we, we learned about and how the, how the system works. Um, the failover conditions were initially unclear, uh, where it does not fail over if all of the, so the um, if any of the uh, heartbeats are live. So that was, again, something we had to find out. Um, and really, the HA experience on this really is the only thing that's threatened the three-month window uh, to production. And honestly, we're still making sure at this, at literally this week, that things are, uh, you know, fixable or working, what have you. I expect that will be, but that's been that's been our big our, our big concern. Um, uh, other notable items: uh, the performance of the system still just blows us away. We have staff lining up to get their data on the system. I'm having to say we're just not ready to go production yet. We still need to do failover tests and that sort of thing. And I don't want to do that with your live data unless it's unless you're willing to accept that it might just go down for a while without notice. Um, we actually had some people said okay. Um, <laughs> Many things aren't well supported in the GUI, we found out. Uh, support often has to drop us to the NFS console to perform actions. So something to be aware of, um, if you're gonna be admitting this, get to know that NMS console. Uh, staff do love the ability to get to the underlying OS to troubleshoot. There is, there is a method you can actually get to the underlying OS. We have staff who are familiar with AIX, Solaris, Linux, and we can get down in there, we can see the logs, and we can run you know, some standard utilities. It, it's very, very helpful, we like that. Um, we did have some infant mortality in the equipment. We had three drives fail in the first week of delivery. That sort of thing happens when you're shipping them halfway across the country. After that, we haven't had any trouble, but you know, just something we experienced. Uh, coordination between the hardware vendor support, uh, our area data system, Nick Center, could be improved, I think. They're, they're both really trying. They're both doing a really good job with us, but I think sometimes they end up talking past each other. And that's just, you know, that, that's something that happens. We have to, we work with them on that. But, uh, you know, like I said, that, that's, that, is, that is one thing that happens when your hardware and your software are separate. So be prepared to deal with that. The hardware itself physically is decidedly unsexy. It's not what we're putting up by our, our public viewing window. Uh, doesn't matter, it's in our server room, it works. Um, but uh, some people really like to have the nice flashing lights and logos, and it's just, it's pretty plain. Um, you know, some, somebody texts saying, I would really like to have it look better. Okay, whatever. Um, <laughs> The snapshots are easy, tracking them is hard. Again, this is something that they're looking at dealing with in 312 and later. Um, uh, just something to be aware of, but like I say, the, the, we, we love the, slap, the snapshot. Uh, the built-in support, this is really cool. For the Windows um, client data version recovery is very impressive to the end users. Uh, with this system, you do a snapshot, we just nightly snapshot, whatever. User goes out there, they have a file, they have a directory. Um, they right click and it says, there's this option that shows up in the menu, it says previous versions. It's built into Windows functionality. You can go there to any of those snapshots and it'll pull it and they can get their, it'll mount it and they can get their previous version. You know, this is something they've never had before. Those of us, those who've worked with us on some of the early, early adoption stuff, that just impresses the hell out of them. So I'm gonna stop here. This is my backup slides, which is a whole nother, whole nother bit to uh, ZFS itself. Um, I'd be glad to anyone, talk to anyone about, about that. I've, again, I've got another 30 slides or so of dealing with that. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over. And then, like I say, after, uh, after Larry's done here, we will go ahead and take some questions. I'll be willing to talk to you outside as well. All right. Thank you.